Anyway, um, welcome everyone, family and friends, to the long-awaited, many emailed, high-spirited, deeply considered conversation between visual artists and poets that we call sister arts. I'm Lee Kissling, living proof that you should be careful about ever putting a poet in charge of anything. Before saying any more, I need to remind you about house rules or expect to wear the masks like bank robbers with mouth and nose covered but shifty eyes clearly visible. Now I'll introduce, I already did that, but bear with me. Um, uh, Lana and Margaret and I have logged in some hours, you might, might imagine. We're very close pals and our time together has been delightful, as always. Um, while I'm at it, some thanks are due to FIP Center for the Arts for making the night possible, and they did, after all, remodel the building just for us. And thank you, Anastasia Sharton, Master of the Galleries, Darby Lunsford, Colin Garrity, Mark Kosky, Tom Dolly, Joan Bushman, Nancy Condon, who helped design the chat book, and thanks to Manager Emmanuel and Dan in the booth. Um, finally, thanks to all the artists and poets who participated in the inspired labor of Ekphrasis. We have been amazed at the quality of the artwork and the lyrical composition. You have exceeded our expectations again and made our work such pleasure. This is an extraordinary moment, actually, this gathering of so many talented artists and poets in one place. Most of the artwork is on sale. Please tell Lana or Margaret or Anastasia if you're interested in buying the artwork and poetry will be on display in the gallery until October 24th. There are book sale tables in the lobby tonight so you can stop there. Before we begin, I would like a resounding chorus of boos for these things. So let's do it together. Boo! Boo! Okay, you know what to do. Um, tonight, let's make these just into cameras. Uh, now we're going to hear the poems and s see the artwork on the big screen. Um, poets and artists will join me here on stage. Artists are invited to make extremely brief comments about their work. By extremely brief, I mean less than one minute. Um, you have been given an order of the show document so you know when you're up next, blah, blah, blah. Um, one more tip, the chat book for this event has all the poems and the artwork, but it's not in the same order as what we're doing tonight. So you can look things up and follow, but you have to go to the table of contents to do that. Um, also note that in the chat book, the subject is always on the left-hand side and the response is on the right, just as though we knew what we were doing. So without further ado, let's get started with the amazing artwork of Ian Welshans and the wonderful Still Stillwater poet M.P. Flandrick. Well, I'm having junior high flashbacks. I haven't done public speaking in for a while, so I'll keep it very short. Uh, I'm very honored to be amongst wonderful uh, artists tonight, and I feel very honored to be asked to do a response piece to Mary Pat, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, it's gorgeous. So um, I'm gonna read True North, and it's in two parts. First, if you are lost in a forest, Find trees to befriend you. If you are lost in a city, find a house with its porch light on. It will be mine. Two, crow upwards to your true north. Bird, be compass. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And I wish M.A. was here tonight. I've been um, able to see this piece of art so many times that I feel like it's in my kitchen, and that's where I'd like it to be. It's called, the poem response is called The Artfulness of Gathered Things. Envisioned, created, parts lost and found and salvaged, curb, ditch, old garden shed, 
Grandpa Charlie's garage with copper bull's rings hung on a nail. Grandma's kitchen, stir spoon, the cast iron ship propping the door, trowel on the red step stool. The places we gather bring our old socks and lost mitten, <clears throat> excuse me, tea kettles steaming on the stove 1920 to rusted now. Blue metal flower star once a faucet handle. A child of the family, a boy from Iowa, crams ditch treasure in his pockets. And the artist M.A. free wheels, pinwheels, pinballs, and blues lost things, saved things that wobble, but sees the rainbow in rust, hears a salt shaker that sings and sprinkles joy. Now you see how that worked was that Anne should have left slightly earlier, but that's okay. You can come this way. <laughs> I wrote a little sonnet with a story in it. Love launcher, you reap rust. Disuse curls around your root like a cat rubbing up against a leg. Cupid's off drowsing on some besotted cloud. Dreams of nothing now. Wakes to swig more wine. Pee a golden stream. Sleep. Down here, People pass each other, gazing at their phones. The shuffling, the shushing, shuffling of feet. Eyes blear. Bird song goes unnoticed. Almost. Someone stubble, stumbles. A screen breaks on the sidewalk. Damn. Across the street, tree root, concrete crack. They trip. Their phone also drops onto chalk drawings of hearts. Stop. Cupid wakes, is back. He reaches for the love launcher, fires, fires. They both look up. They find each other's eyes. Next up. Apple by my good friend George Moore, who unfortunately couldn't be here this evening. Um, George and myself a while back got together and decided to um, do a show together. And so I've been documenting George's work now for quite a few years. Um, it's been a privilege and an honor. But so we did a small show. Um, so the next piece is my response to George's piece. Um, I'll call it Adam's apple. It's actually a digital piece using a Wacom tablet. Um, kind of gives uh, the ability to have a freedom that you don't normally have, associate with a computer drawing. Um, I try to keep the, the whims whimsical element of uh, George's work and also kind of keep the narrative, too, of his work. Thank you. Okay. Oh, said Adam after he bit the apple, sort of like his distant male relatives sticking a fork into an electrical socket after they had been warned not to, just to see what it would happen. <laughs> so, no, Eve wasn't the first to bite the apple. So that, that infamy belonged to testosterone, the so-called hero maker, the good and evil spirit that would both build up and tear down the world. Bliss measurement and the reign of numbers. Worship compound interest and kneel before the hiss of the snake, Satan's interminable whisper of missing. You are so missing. You are so not enough. You are so unfair that God keeps his equality with him from you. And thus, it was that Adam took the bait first, falling for the lie to be like God in knowledge. 
He plucked and ate, and his eyes were opened on a sleeping eve, no longer a petite, demure, sweet, docile rib of a woman in his dominion, but a vista of flesh, a theology of thigh, a plus-size, double-plus fertility goddess, goddess he feared he might fall into and never get out of if he remained merely an awestruck clay with bulging eyes and tremulous lip. Now, believing he had to measure up, he reached out the apple to Eve, hoping that when he elbowed her awake, she would eat it all and her eyes opened, see him transformed into a tumescent match, just her size for thrill of flesh on flesh, falling into Dionysian dream beneath their Apollonian reach to rival God. And Eve did eat, and see for a split archetypal second his titan form before they heard a cosmic, "Uh uh-oh, gotcha, said the snake, you're naked. Shame, shame on you. Just wait till your father gets home. (laughs) And so Eden's door was closed behind them as they walked out into mortal life of pain and joy, of childbirth and of the harvest, an honest 5-7 and 5-3 of flesh and spirit with God's good company for the long road home. I was fortunate enough to have a, another piece chosen um, in, in this show. Thank you. Um, this, po- this particular photograph um, is inspired by uh, David's poem, Lullaby. Um, just let me quickly read this. Transient Lullaby is a photograph of graffiti on the side of a freight train um, inspired by David Baldwin's poem, Lullaby. In David's poem, he has the profound final line, blissfully unaware that the instrument is slightly off key. In this image, the colors are not quite harmonious, close, but just a bit off. And the composition is a bit wonky. The tan dots seem to be organized, but the turquoise dots are dancing to a wholly different beat. Then there is a unique red swath that shouldn't work, but somehow does, in an extra note perhaps, or an extra note perhaps. How many of us can honestly say that our instrument is in key? Does perfect pitch truly exist? What an amazing piece. Lullaby. Whatever the cadence and color, it seems that most lives suffer an overabundance of notes within their single octave. Most seem fixed upon a certain soothing melody and practice unceasingly, negligently inserting sharps and flats, blissfully unaware that the instrument is slightly off key. I'm Susan Stram Penman, and I responded to David Baldwin's poem. Um, the journey in the poem reminded me of the journey a piece of earth or clay takes to become a functional object or piece of art. So in that sense, it inspired me. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Stoned. Called forth from Ian's pressed mud, thrown in ancient times from the flood to stand alone above arid plains, and there to brave the unholy extremes of frigid nights and blazing days, to endure sizzling bolts in the almighty torrent as just punishment of forgotten sins, while furious volleys wash open scars to ferry the liberated rubble past the clutches of the thirsty desert, and into the restless sea as it angrily parts to swallow the jagged remnants of the holy mountain. 
damned beyond deliverance and so cast away, abandoned to the caprice of the bewildering vigor of constant movement and unceasing repetition in thousand-year free-for-alls of endless scraping and sliding and tumbling in and out and within the restless surf, a constant combat of polishing and smoothing into a determined lassitude. An arbitrary redemption of vagabond pebble is recklessly pouched with a congregation of prodigal rocks, patiently outwearing their inconvenient salvation from the lethargy of secluded beaches. Could this cobble be predestined to be resurrected from the leather mausoleum to be wantonly flung in a mist of martial airs? to be the stone that Goliath knew only with crossed eyes and last breath. Thank you. Remember, speakers, you may take the moment to pull your mask off too so we can hear a little better if you feel comfortable doing it. Did, yeah, here he comes. All right. <laughs> All right. Does, mm. The artist is not here. The artist present. is not here. Oh, okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. Hi, I'm Thomas R. Smith. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a piece that uh, Gary Carlson made. Um, inspired by a poem of mine called Basswood Leaves, uh, which was actually a love poem. Uh, my wife and I, uh, 35th anniversary, was last year on uh, October 19th. So it's, we just did number, uh, number 36. So that's where this poem comes from. Basswood Leaves. <clears throat> October is hasting toward November. More sky now. More room for light to get in. The basswood drops its great heart-shaped leaves on the path, each a valentine at our feet. Why do I feel so certain that they fall without regret, without sadness, that instead they're love notes from the earth? This is the season of revelation, our vision less occluded, we see better what was always there, hidden in plain sight, which we've hidden from ourselves. Could it be that the soul does not grieve, but loves this fall time for the joy of what it can make next from the art materials of this world? Is it an artist in us who sings through the melancholy of autumn leaves? Just as the basswood tree will bring back its heart-shaped leaves, surely some branch on the tree of the universe will know how to make a heart like yours, a heart like mine. Wow. Thank you. I'm just flying solo tonight, right? <laughs> OK, all right, that's fine. Uh, this poem is called Orb Weaver. <clears throat> um, do we need to say anything about these or not? Um, no? 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 Oh, oh, okay. Okay, that's fine. It, it's pretty straightforward what it is. Orb Weaver. There it was, deep in the Kinnikinnick woods, hovering like a smoke ring where young maple and young elm contended for space so that it was impossible to tell just where it was anchored, where mottled morning sun struck through to light it. At first, I absurdly thought it a CD someone had strung in the trees so round and prismatic appeared in its suspension, or perhaps just a hologram of a CD, flimsy, shimmering, 
yet dimensional as the sun above and behind fired red and gold tones into its close concentric grooves. At last, recognizing it for what it was, I could make out the bright bead of the orb weaver's body, working in meticulous circles inward toward the empty center, that perfectly round nothing, so accommodating and yielding to the fine intensity of her plan, her craft. It's kind of a secret tribute to artists. Thank you. All right. OK? Just me again. OK. All right. OK. All right. So this is the poem that I, um, that I wrote from uh, Fazia Khan's uh, sculpture, uh, Bird on Birch. And um, I, th I think there was something about the northern austerity of the image that really attracted to me. And, um, I've done this a couple of times now with the uh, Sister Arts uh, program, and my method is I'll I'll take a an image of the <clears throat> of the art piece and let it lay around on my desk for about a month and just work on my unconscious, and then I write the poem. So this is called Dark Bird. There are birds of paradise in southern forests bright bouquets of flame who rise with symphonic cries to drown themselves in sun. I dreamt for myself such splendor, long to be seen by eyes, my song to be remembered forever by the breezes. But my truth is elsewhere, my real self in the rough music I learn from the northern springtime, my feet printing a white paper road, unwritten page of beginnings, though sunlight occasionally unlocks from my black feathers a kind of rainbow. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, artists. So is Ragda here? Well, um, not surprisingly, this poem is called Window, um, based on this rather stunning piece of artwork. Reflection in the glass, unburdened by irony, doubt, loneliness, or remorse, looking the same way I am looking, but thinking no thoughts, just a flat image of myself, until one day, <clears throat> until one day she turns to look at me from her two-dimensional place. I look back, I say, I'm sorry about your hair, your astigmatism, your crooked teeth, your clumsiness, your forgetfulness. Then she leans forward, does that pretty thing with her lips, and kisses me artfully through the glass. Thank you. Sue. Oh, man. I think this is stunning. I was just thrilled when I saw it. No Way Trees was uh, Ragda's response to my poem, No Way Trees. In Mom's familiar script on the yellowed photograph, Susie with Leaves. And there I am on the front porch in Grandma's pink babushka holding a basket of autumn leaves. And I remember thinking, no flower is this red, not even a rose, which made me want to rescue each leaf out under the sugar maple, 
from the burn pile that my brother would ignite later at the curb, trying for the biggest fire on the block, which made me cry and feel guilty that I enjoyed the smell, all those leaf lives lost just when they were at their peak of splendor, like my daughter, decades later, who grew up in Arizona, longing for climbing trees and disbelieving scenes of the Midwest autumn blaze until we moved to Minnesota in October and she saw her first red tree. Ironically, in front of the cemetery where her ashes would later be buried. No way, no way, she murmured. And I took her picture beside the tree, thinking that I could print it out with the caption, Laura with leaves, to display in a red frame alongside the photo of me, which I never did. But each autumn, the no way trees do their thing. And I startle at their beauty, as well as grieve each leaf more splendid than a rose, gone to ground after a too brief summer. Oh, she's, okay. This was the piece that inspired this poem. Um, and like Thomas said, I too had this laying on my desk for a while. It had to percolate, and my poem is simply the red fox. She's nature's geometry, transecting the plain of the meadow with the long line of her lope, an elegance of angles, a cache of sounds, vixen's scream, gecker, howl. She's been known to bury her dead with twigs and dirt, then linger, before following Earth's magnetic field, which it's believed she sees as a sphere of shadow darkening toward magnetic north. Then the parabola of her pounce, the wonder of her, she who lives by what we cannot see and does not call it absence, this amalgam of Canaday and Phyllis with her feral grief and hunger walking in two worlds. My name is Jan Johnson Drentel, and the poem I'm going to read is inspired by Kyle's piece, Airshipped. And Kyle's not here tonight, but I would just like to say this is a poem about time, place, and space in which we travel as individuals and as a race, carrying our history, imagining our future, and dealing with our foibles. The title of the poem is Flotsam and Jetsam Take Me for a Ride. You may not see me, but I feel the steely wind on my face, the north wind that Nana Nanook brings. And I see her in the shape, the smoke made from wood that propels this improbable jalopy through the air past gerrymandered shrinking ice flows. Perspective is important at sea and in the air where a tiny Jeanne d'Arc stands on the prow mumbling kings and bishops in disappointment, refusing to warm herself at the fire. Perhaps we launch at, launch at dawn from concrete mountaintops in Hong Kong, slipping through glass canyons and out to sea, driven by a tsunami from Nippon. We can only hope to sail smoothly past L'Ile de Dordure, an island, a garbage patch in the Pacific, twice the size of Texas, goop made up of plankton-like bits of plastic diapers, dog collars, debris from garbage barges. We are held together with glue and old leather, 
but those mass matchsticks fore and aft won't last in a hurricane. And sometimes a screw is a screw and not an understudy for a propeller. Meanwhile, flotsam and jetsam hang out below decks, reminisce about potable water when it was free while waiting for the poker game to begin. Way, hey, and up she rises. We all are drunken sailors. Um, this, is a, this next piece is a collaboration um, done with Sebastian Rivera, who, uh, uh, who couldn't be here tonight either. But um, it was a process of telling each other stories about what water meant to us as children from our various backgrounds and what our pa parents told us about the saints and gods of water a process of winnowing out so many disturbing facts and figures about water in this country, not to mention the rest of the world. In the end, a sort of prayer that we might learn from our ancestors and the world around us and come to our senses. I also would like to draw your attention, if you have the book, to some pretty awful figures and just a few of them about how much bottled water was delivered to Flint, Michigan, and how much was sold from a a, um, an aquifer right next to Flint, Michigan, right near it in the same period. Anyway, water, an incantation, a divination, an invitation. One, I am a daughter of the river conceived on her frozen bank, suckled at her source, planted in her luxurious mud. I come from a long line of women who birthed babies, lost babies, dug for water, pumped water, hauled water, like half the people of this earth. I come from a long line of fathers who worked until their lungs cracked, backs broke, their land died, and game became extinct, like the other half of people on this earth. I come from a long line of peasants, farmers, immigrants, indigenous to somewhere else, like many of the people on this earth. I come from a long line of people who need drinking water every day to survive, like all of the people on this earth. Two, we started in water. Osiris was fished out of the water, reincarnated by Isis. Then the priests told us we were dust. Helen Keller's first word was water. The women called the water protectors to Standing Rock and they branched like the rivers to blends, bless, to cleanse, to defend. We are water, water is us. Three, before it was a slogan to sell beer, the land of sky blue waters was a song of praise, a rough translation of the people's name for place, a blessing and a gratitude for the water that reflected the sky. Listen to the water rushing icy from the mountaintops languid and lukewarm, lying with the summer prairie, in fits and hidden starts from beneath the desert floor, in ocean depths, nurturing her lovers and her secrets. The water will speak. Listen. Thank you. My name is Ron Brown. Um, my medium is Afrofuturism. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I live in North Minneapolis. Um, I grew up in, in the neighborhood that George Floyd was murdered in. Um, and so um, when I created this piece, it was kind of almost, and it's, it's what's sad about it is that it could be a mood on any day of this, of this, of this earth, any day of this week, any month of this, day, of this year. So. Um, it's just kind of my humble way of looking back at the adversity and staring it in the face. So that's what this piece means.
Familiar does not equal healthy. Your use of negative space is astounding. Considering I know past collections, white on black could be cliche. Somehow it manages to be anything except that very thing from you. Strokes that almost encapsulate open space. Is it openness or emptiness though? I vacillate on the answer always. Lines forming heart shape as brow softens, forms face, strong nose, depth in gaze. A knowing portrayed as reflections, acrylic partially forced, maybe willed, some will never understand. Happy accidents you paint, when in the vastness of needed dark, I see, I grasp fully, I can see how far the stars reach, I see gray in all the white against the black. I see both, and perception bends reality. You see what you see, and I see something different. My name is Tukumba Tyrone Aiken, and um, uh, Hawana can't be here, but I asked Crystal to read Hawana's poem. And um, Hawana and I have had this long relationship of building institutions, curating shows, creating art, telling stories, and a lot of times we can usually sit down, have tea, and exchange, but because of COVID-19, we had to do a drive-by of the artwork. I said, you come drive-by and I'll throw it in the car. And, um, but when I knew that I was gonna have this task, I figured the painting's not gonna make anything easy for me, so why should I make it easy for Hawana? <laughs> and this one builds on layers and layers of things, and I kept on begging it to give me the title because Hawana's gonna want that. And she said, that's okay, I'll just take it and work on it. And then finally, the Destiny's Contortious uh, came as a way of looking at our lives, the things we choose and the things we don't choose, but hopefully survive. Mm -hmm. And so I'll have Crystal read Juana's poem. Thank you. And this is an honor, by the way. I know Juana from Community. Making the journey alone. When I come back, I want to be a Tacumba Aiken painting, you say, after a second glass of wine. On the Sabbath, everything we serve ourselves is nectar kissed, food for the gods that live within. Hours ago, I sat with you, playing spades. You ate seconds of my watermelon salad, called it a masterpiece, told me to keep in touch, then climbed up on my roof rooftop and flew away. I saw you high, appendages a flutter, and wondered how you managed to do it all. You told me to send you the recipe. I had previously been troubled by the Kalamatas. Who would serve this melon with nothing black for it to love? Its red flesh, a most sacred reminder of the tenacity found in our motherland. But the recipe did not call for blackness. Still, I snuck some in, mixed it with the brown, brined and pitted. We de debated the feta. It seemed too bold a move. This fruit of a trailing, scrambling vine was not unlike ourselves. This meal of black and brown and white and red and tangled is not unlike our American skin. You taught me to plant the seeds, what to watch for, how to coax the sprout and persuade the weeds to find someplace else to grow. You besmirched the wide-eyed bunnies who came calling with their tongues out so the children would not give them our ripening feast. And today, your body supped up the loot.
Okay, I just met Paula for the first time tonight, except on Zoom, yes. which is kind of amazing. Um, I hate Zoom, <laughs> pretty much. We are really sick of Zoom, and uh, when uh, Paul had the, uh, I don't think you came up with the title first. I think this is a collaboration, and I think collaborations are really an awful thing to do to people. <laughs> just so you know. Um, but um, Paula had this be these beautiful little collages that she did in paper of cut out hands touching each other. And so I immediately thought of those places in nursing homes where people are have their hands against the glass and their elderly loved ones are behind the glass. And I think that is a really strong symbol of the whole stupid pandemic. So. Thank you, Nancy. Hi. Um, so, uh, Lee and Margaret and Lana, I just um, want to thank you again so much. This is really an honor. So, um, And so to collaborate with, I just want to quickly say these are some really uh, like stitched together lines from some early pandemic j journals I thought looked quilt-like. So Ghost of Human Contact. Stationed across quarantines, one solitary night after another, light years between each star, to our eyes, a constellation implies a whole. Michael said as the group planned our next Zoom meeting, my asshole calendar still asks for the location of events. After months of sheltering, I wrote cold mirages. I had no idea outside of winter. Every room of the house, a kind of altar I roamed through. Votives on the sills, their lit overtures. See you soon, we text each other. Yeah, scare quotes. Smiley face emoticon. Heart. Heart, heart. All year, I will want to be more, more what? But often, I'll just sulk away polar vortex nights in front of HBO Max in a new relationship with my own resistance, developing a twitch in my upper lip. The whole world a single-minded wish I hadn't previously thought to notice. To be more everything, remember, possible, desire, falling, ringless. Remember two separate, equally stupid dreams last night about romantic longing. Grief and grief and grief, then dinner. Early on, it was suggested we hug a tree. Do you remember? We were told, no, you're not alone in feeling alone. Loud music as rice boils, big Joni in the kitchen, dance away the invisible feelings. In the dreams, I was either searching for something or hiding from something, unclear. Like waking life, it could have been a both and situation. In winter, a body waits like any seed in a pouch. Equal measure, neither resurrection nor burial. Plume mule of a future encased in a shell. I apologize. We had a, we had to change things slightly, so I'm sorry we did that. But let's, yeah. Okay. So um, I think your situation is that both of your artists are not here now. Okay. After Nancy Congdon, so you're on your own, doll. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Nancy, I'm so glad you were here. Um, <laughs> uh, this is, oh, I'm not a great enunciator, but this poem is called The Royal, R-O-I-L, in the Royal, R-O-A-Y. What? R-O-Y-A-L, yeah. English major. K 
kettle of caught storm blue rain, water for snow crop, spider wart, blood roots, red juice from a cut, each human body too full of river as any glass or petaled vessel in this watershed. What is forgetfulness that grain by grain we neglect exchange, the oar of us sintering, denatured, our natal stream a clogged drain, gray rather than this alive, heron's egg cracked open, blue or the blue of song taking to sky. Um, and oh, this painting is a response to this poem. Per aspera ad astra, which uh, means from difficulty to the stars. I want to remember how it was stationed outside 2 a.m., 3 a.m., the Perseids streaking across the ink wet forever of a quarantine. Looking as up as possible, it seemed that the whole world was me and this meteor shower and this night orchestra of insects single-minded in their desire for one another. Just one wishable star falling after another and my left hand lighter, I guess, ringless. I hadn't thought to notice until then. Um, thanks. Hi, I'm uh, David Markson. I hang my hand in River Falls, Wisconsin. I was honored to be um, asked to be part of this show. I haven't met Isaac yet. I have tend to meet him after this program is over. I was attracted to his poem. This my piece is a response to his poem. I was attracted to it because of his irreverent attitude to how people go, get so engrossed in the um, virtual worlds in their pockets that they forget to look around at the world around them and notice things that are happening. So I'll meet you later, Isaac. And the finger of God in Namibia has collapsed. What with the wind and everyone forgetting that his finger was there in the first place, so no one thought to help him stitch it back on. And anyway, the healthcare in Namibia is shit these days because climate change and the devastations of colonialism have screwed over their economy. And the eyes of God, the big dog and the keel, have been smudged out with the light pollution and so many people being stuck doing night shifts and everyone forgetting where the big dog and the keel even are or that Sirius and Canopus are in them unless they have the app for that. And the thumb of God in Oregon keeps accidentally killing hikers with the signs being too far apart and those edges being too steep and no one stopped to ask if they're meant to be hiking on his thumb anyway and the hand of God on Amazon Prime was canceled after its second season with no one ever actually clicking on the damn thing and Ron Perlman not being famous anymore and no one wanting to watch a TV show called the hand of God, because they're pretty sure it would either be preachy and cheap or something. And the chair of God, in a quiet town in Canada he moved to after the last election, is creaky key because he's been sitting in it, fuming over his damn finger falling apart and the fact that people get their news from memes and feeling like Hera's having a better go of retirement. And though, of course, that's just on her Facebook. Gods and older people still use Facebook. And she's really just as lonely and forgotten and worried and lost. And just because she posted a picture with the kids on a beach in Jamaica doesn't mean she's any less collapsed. that, huh? <laughs> that was great. Um, this uh, was a piece I did 
after the Bangladesh factory fire, and I burned fabric. If you burn fabric without wearing a mask and you inhale the fumes, you have a respiratory problem for a few days. The women in the factory didn't have the luxury of leaving the building. So I have to say, Isaac, that I, when I read your poem and then I read your comment about you didn't know whether it did any good to do art because, you know, what difference does it make? You know, and I just heard your other poem and I see where you're coming from, but I don't know, I think it still makes a difference to speak up and do these things. Just, just saying. So the one bit of uh, important context is the title is from a, a board meeting that the owner of Walmart who uh, got fabrics from a factory, one of the many, many factories, I didn't know which one this was in reference to, um, said as an explanation for why they didn't have um, unlocked doors. Um, apparently doors that unlocked from the inside would have been uh, too expensive. So, To whom it may concern, Redacted company, which values its employees and the work they do, regrettably must inform you that on the date of Saturday, November the 24th, upon arriving at work at the Tazreen Fashion Factory, Casualty 37, in the course of doing, well, we don't specifically know what they were doing, clothes, making things, you know. It's all very technical and, well, <laughs> that's not really mine or any of our, well, redacted company, which would like to remind you of the great opportunity factory work provides to individuals in the developing worlds areas after expertise. Owning a business being a very different sort of occupation than working in one. Though of course, neither is more or less important and redacted, but incidentally, very worker positive company values all of its employees at all levels and of all walks of life. And well, regardless, we or that is redacted company that will definitely change certain highly visible aspects of whatever happened is not acutely aware of what exactly Casualty 37 did at the factory. Though, of course, we do not know that of at some point they went in, and uh, at another point, clothes would be shipped out. But, well, we, that, that is redacted company, that is reasonably sure you will have forgotten about most of this by next Monday, regrets to inform you that Casualty 37 has passed away in a fire in a locked factory. Of course, all due diligence was done to ensure that when workers were locked in the factories, said factories would not be on fire. But accidents do happen, and of course, while it may be pertinent knowledge to the public how exactly 37, along with the other 100 or so exact numbers being difficult, you understand, of our employees passed away, as such details could show plausibly pertinent details as to the extent of redacted but incidentally very worker-positive companies, factories are run. Contrary to the demands of, well, human decency, but unfortunately, as much as we would like to be clear about the material conditions in which our employees worked, out of uh, respect for Casualty 37's family, we must unfortunately leave it at the fact that, well, they seem to have died somehow. And the doors seem to have been locked somehow, and people seem to have had to jump from windows, and, well, we don't really know, but it was on fire. We hope you will understand. Sincerely, redacted company that is currently having an advertisement filmed where children are smiling and employees are looking vaguely proud of a long day's work and there's positive music playing in the background. I'm Doc. Oh, here we go. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Gino Cole. Uh, I titled this piece uh, Our Face of Society. So, this is more so in terms of how we present ourselves on social media, um, as in terms of like, you know, everything is perfect, you know, there's no flaws, 
Um, so this piece is like clearly somebody behind a mask. That's everything is perfect in this um, image and stuff. Uh, I mean, me myself, I know I'm guilty of that, but every now and then I show my uh, some of my flaws just to not give um, certain people uh, like pressure to feel as though that um, their piece has to be good or everything has to be, you know, like perfect or something. So, yeah. I'm reading out of the book. The stranger made of tar and old dreams, alone in a boxcar, on the train that runs from Johannesburg to St. Paul. Her colored mass full of textured ridges that mirrored passing land, a pastoral of humming steel. Minor chords flow from her eyes, black pool ether, dealing in myths and promises, clack, 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 clack. Her cloak, an ancient map, swirled in reds, indigo, violet. The violence it takes to blow a tree down in rage. Her yell, a thousand train whistles and breaking glass. Only heard by the dead and soon to be. The stranger, Minneapolis, the train out of track. Now at the heart of the world, the thumps th slowly spread. Thump, 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 until there are no thumps. Um, this, this is another of my piece. Uh, I call it uh, United We Stand. Um, this piece uh, reminds me of um, my childhood. I'm an immigrant, uh, first generation from Nigeria. So um, this is more so how, how I remember my childhood of, um, of me and my friends uh, where, I mean, I've, I see it as this is a unity or so because in term cases, especially from my country or so, they say, you know, it's pretty corrupt or, you know, they have like different things going on and stuff. But as, as someone that lives there, that lived there and, um, and you know, coming here and and, and like um, looking at the news and stuff, you know, I would I would actually believe it if I didn't, you know, live there at the time. So um, this is just uh, so I feel as though this piece just reminds me of like you know my childhood and how I lived, um, you know, back home. So here. Thank you. Uh, we we have uh, two people that are not here, Michael Clibber Diggs. And um, Michael also wrote a poem about United We Stand, and I wished he could have been here because it's pretty fabulous. Some of you may know Michael. Um, just had a book published. He's achieved a lot in the poetry world in the last year and beyond. Um, one of the things I remember about that, not, not to speak for Michael, but, but one of the things he admired about this painting was there was a missing person kind of in the lower right-hand corner that he could only see part of, and he felt it was sort of symbolic and emblematic of, of everything um, in his own life that reminded him of fighting and he remembered fighting in school, and he remembered fighting in sports, and he remembered fighting in college. And again, I won't speak for him, but if you have the book, book do take the time to read the poem. It's a beautiful two-column poem. It's lovely. Thank you so much, Tino. So unfortunately, Michael Clever Diggs isn't here. This is the response piece I did based on his piece um, called Nature Walk. Um, it's a beautiful poem. Take the time to read it. But it's about um, just a mundane walk through the asphalt streets of the city um, with crabapple trees flowering and falling to the ground. Um, as robins sing, um, I see this chorus as a thread going through the piece, speaking back and forth to each other. And it just reminds us to 
um, be present uh, for that, this dream that lives outside of our, our doorsteps. So. Thank you, Kate. In, in Michael's note, he said um, that he had never had a bir bird walk with him before, which I thought was pretty great. So thank you both. Guess who made that? <laughs> so, I'm Lana Schoberg, and um, my, the next two pieces are response pieces to the poems that you're going to hear. This piece is called Tres Mariposas, Three Butterflies, and I chose this poem, I Couldn't Help It is the name of the poem, about two months after my 94-year-old friend and non-biological mom, as I called her, took off from this earth, no doubt as a butterfly. She loved butterflies, and she loved me. <clears throat> now I too look up. I can't help it. Trace Mariposas is a place to rest, to pray, to remember, to imagine, to dream. Mm -hmm. This work is amazing to me. It, she made concrete fly, and that, that's a pretty amazing thing. You made concrete fly. Uh, this a poem is exactly the way it happened. I, it, it happened exactly this way. I wanted to show you the reference to Durer's praying hands. I think most of you know that. It's just the hands, and they're like that. Okay, Durer's praying hands. And, of course, the wings are just like that. Head down, walking towards home, overseer of tired thoughts, scattering like mice on hearing an open door. I saw an amaze of pavement ahead, countless butterflies gripping the road with such small bodies under such big wings folded high above them, palm to palm like Durer's hands. And then they must have sen sensed my footfalls and having already play prayed, opened their wings with thanks, my thanks, for a black with edges of fine fire opal blue, thanks for the light of lavender, thanks for the orange and black pilgrim monarch, all rising up first parallel to the ground and then off up in profound flight as light as grace, calling them into the higher road, calling me. I couldn't help but look up. My second piece is also a response piece. It's titled An Old Woman, um, inspired by a poem by the same name. For me, the poem was about climate change. And so how ironic that I was working on it when the air was thick with smoke um, from the fires in California and Canada earlier this year, if you remember that. What this um, photo doesn't show are the footprints I added to the installation created from a flat tire that I got while on a bicycle trying to figure out how to make footprints for this piece. <laughs> really. <laughs> I wanted the footprints to raise the question of how do our actions kill the trees, burn and exhaust our resources, flood our lands, cloud the air and hide the sun. Did anyone notice the hidden words from the poem in the footprints? An old woman in a deep forest, still as the trees. Half a bushel of pears in her arms. This is knowledge, she whispers, to a man stepping out from the darkness. He eyes the fruit, his hands full of dirt, reach for the lump of sunshine on top. 
taking a large bite. His gums leak blood and tar. But it is no matter. The man keeps on. Bite after bite, he moves on to the next and to the next until there are no more pears, no more pear trees, no more forest. The woman standing in front of him is fading away, for she has no pears. The man leaves the bones behind and stumbles home. I'm Ann Piper. I really wish Mary was here because I, I just love this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little about this poem that, that I wrote, even though Lee said not to. So, <clears throat> so um, I was thinking about how COVID started, maybe by transmission from a, from a bat, maybe not. Um, and, and how, if it was a bat, that bat had no intention of causing a pandemic. And also how viruses work by infecting and multiplying, again, with no intent. And seeing everything as miraculous as I do, containing sparks, whatever God is, um, sparks of God, whatever God is, it occurred to me that if God is everywhere, God is kind of nowhere also, in no one place. So I was thinking, how do I connect? Where do I direct my prayers, specifically for the pandemic to end? The god bat smites with a divine virus, like an asteroid vanishing a planet, intentionless. Millions die, millions of god humans die. Meanwhile, these sanctified bees bumble and hum and the grasshoppers trill their plaintive god songs. A golden cat stalks, pounces and gnaws as if by rote. Little gods devoured everywhere, all the time. No wonder we can't connect. God has scattered itself like so much pollen, spent itself as a dying country will. These poppies bow and sway like tiny prayer flags beneath the old sun while wails and prayers float up, haunted, cacophony, urgent, adrift. My name is Barbara Band, and I'm from Roberts, Wisconsin. I'm a fiber artist. Um, uh, this is a response to the poem, and I had a, always had a hard time with this title. I love the John Deere implement dealer who loves to love. And I, in reading this poem, it just haunted me. It just stayed with me, and it haunted me, and I could not get a vision. I could not get a vision of what to do with it. I took it to friends, I had them read it, they read it, read it. We talked about it, I, had, I said, what's your vision? What do you get, what do you get? And I've, I went around and around in this poem and, um, and I decided it had to be a person, it had to be a farmer. It had to be, he had to be on his knees. He had to be partially part of the earth and the earth part of him. And I, my connection to this poem was about the fact that our footprint is so big just to survive and how we've chosen to survive and um, humbled by it and the damage we've done and how do we, how do we make amends. So it really, um, the poem I think is amazing. And I, if you're not gonna read it, then you should definitely read it in the book. It's haunting. Well, I'm not gonna read it actually. I'm, I want you to all read it when you get home. But one thing I will tell you is the poem is a villanelle which is a very interesting and difficult form of poem in which there is repetition of a whole lines. Various lines repeat at various specific intervals through the poem. And, I, and Jean Lutz is one of the few people I know that could create such a 
masterpieces that and I wish he was here so I just wanted to tell you be sure and read the Jean Lutz poems when you get home Barb I love your sculpture thank you Well, here we are, approaching the end. And somehow or other, I end up at the end twice. So bear with me. Um, this is a surrealistic poem by a fellow named David Raven, who is not here. Um, he. He combines uh, modern things with old things and puts them in contexts and in light that is, is odd or interesting or different. Um, this, this poem that he, or this painting that he created, um, he told me it had this, the story was to do with, with his wife and he had gone to a, an estate sale and they'd found these old phones and they looked very homemade, and they were on the farm, and the belief was that they used them between the farm buildings. <laughs> That's where they used these phones, the farmer and his wife. So that got me thinking about it, and I wrote this poem called Holler, in which I tried to imagine the wife and the husband farmers talking to each other from the house to the barn. Holler, an old word not used anymore, though nowadays they can holler from Earth to outer space, which seems to me, anyway, extravagant. Like, what would you say? How you boys doing up there? Things are fine down here, I guess. Now we can holler from the house to the barn without shouting with these wood telephones, but part of why I'm in the barn is because I like being alone, not having to talk all the time, except to myself and to these bovine characters with their limited vocabularies. <laughs> Lately, she called me when I was milking. I picked up and said, what? She said, don't say what, say hello. Manners, telephone manners. Nice to hear from you, I say. I'm putting you on hold for a minute, I say. The cows think this is funny, laughing and farting. Settle down, I tell them. This piece is by Lissa Carpe, and she can't be here tonight, but I did want to let you know sort of where this came from. It's from Project 30.1. It's a mural installation that recognizes the tragic event that occurred on May 25th of last year, 30.1 miles from here. The intent of the mural is not to focus on the individuals involved in this event, or to point fingers or to assign blame. It exists to acknowledge that the moment in time when George Floyd was killed had an immediate and significant impact on society locally, regionally, nationally, and globally. It sparked a new and renewed commitment by many to understand racial issues and racism and their role to create change. This piece is by Lissa Carpe, a Liberian American painter whose work is inspired by her first generation immigrant identity and a background in mental health work. The entire mural is on view at the north outside wall of the Phipps. It's hard to see it at night, but drive by during the day. It's really worth looking at. Thank you. I think this poem is, or this painting is quite wonderful, actually. There's so many pieces to it, and it, it has the quality of a map, uh, has the quality of memory piece, 
And uh, what I take to be over the top of the woman's head seems to me like a village. So I think that's a memory piece, maybe. And thinking back, how many generations? I don't know. Um, I was very moved by it. Um, the poem I wrote is called Family Matters. I asked my African cousin, my shirt tail relation, if we were both black, they would call us brothers. But I'm not black, so I'll call you cousin. What explains this naming? Questions for you. Does it matter who my cousins are? To whom and why and, or why not? Answers? Maybe to you and me, to us. And think on this. If it matters to one of you, then it matters to both. Cousins share a common grandparent. The cousin label, first cousin, second cousin, etc., changes depending on which grandparent the cousins share. A second cousin, once removed, is either the child of your second cousin or the parent of your third cousin. They are once removed, once re they are once removed because you are separated by one or more generations on the long line dance back to your common grandparent your great, 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 etc. If you came from Europe sailing past the Statue of Liberty with a ragged suitcase, or if you came in chains in the stinking hold of a ship, either way, we are cousins. In this numerological veil of generations, of origins, if in fact we are all cousins, then I just might call you my brother. Um, thank you. Um, I would like, if you would, just one more round of applause for all artists, cousins, no. poets, artists. In closing, if you have books for sale in the lobby, remember to stop out there, or I'm going to keep your money. Um, we finished in record time. I'm very proud of that. Good for us. Um, we're going to be around for a while, so feel free to chat with each other, talk and visit. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone who participated. Um, I haven't seen many of you for quite a while owing to the pandemic, and it's pretty wonderful to draw you out for whatever reason. So thank you for that. Um, thank you all for the inspiration that made this night possible. <laughs>